Hello and welcome to Future Building. I'm Matthew Aitchison and I'm professor at Monash University and CEO of Building 4.0 CRC, a cooperative R&D hub for the building industry. In this podcast, we take a broad look at buildings and building in contemporary society and what's coming down the pipeline in the future. In upcoming episodes, we'll talk with invited guests and experts in the field where we'll cover news and trends along with research and developments in the industry. Have we built our last skyscraper? In this episode, I speak with Professor Anna Beim about her exciting work on the intersection of industrialized building and sustainability. In June 2022, I visited Anna and her team in Copenhagen, and we took a quick tour of the team's work, which included recycled bricks to prefabricated thatched buildings. And ever since then, I've been itching to interview Anna and get inside some of these ideas. Anna is head of SINARC, Centre for Industrialised Architecture, and professor at the Royal Danish Academy School of Architecture, Design and Conservation. She's trained as an architect and has a wide-ranging interest in buildings that started in the humanities and the study of building tectonics, or the way that buildings come together, leading on to the study of building technology and building sustainability. Most recently, Anna and her team have taken a deep look into the circular economy, which I think is going to be of huge interest to our audience. Unlike many colleagues who study industrialized buildings, Synarch's work has a particular view and approach towards industrialization and the marriage between pre-industrial materials and techniques with advanced manufacturing processes. I particularly love the part about planetary boundaries and working backwards from what, in the future, every global citizen could expect in terms of the resources that they might have at their disposal. I think this is a really important topic. I hope you enjoy our interview. I spoke with Anna in January of 2023 from a houseboat in the center of Copenhagen. Anna, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation. It's absolutely my pleasure. Um, Anna, as we heard in the introduction, uh, you're the head of SINARC, the Centre for Industrialised Architecture at the Royal Danish Academy. Uh, I just thought we'd start by asking you to tell us a little more about SINARC and its history. Well, SINARC is a small research centre affiliated with the Royal Danish Academy School of Architecture. And we have um, existed uh, since 2004. The centre was... um, conceived or conceptualized by my late professor um, and a number of his good colleagues. Um, They thought that at the time in the early zeros that there was a need for an architectural perspective on the construction industry. Also being a practicing architect, he knew that from his professional life that architects have a very central Um, say or role in terms of developing new components or new solutions um, in the architectural design process. He also knew or sensed that in the educational uh, programs at our school, the architectural students were maybe not aware of this sort of uh, opportunity or or the role uh, as an architect uh, we could have. So the center was... um, launched from the perspective of now wanting to have a greater focus on these topics and also having um, research behind the um, the educational programs. Um, we were asked to be sort of the, um, the spearhead of the sort of collaborative initiatives uh, or agreements with a number of different actors in the construction industry. Um, and that counted from large-scale um, manufacturing companies to uh, smaller architectural firms. Um, we have mainly worked with the industry complex from the perspective of integrated product deliveries um, as a concept, uh, that being sort of the central elements of the construction industry Um What are the processes? What are the products? Um, Who are the the stakeholders and the whole organizational uh, setup? But over the past eight years, we have concentrated more and more on the the material aspects of material properties, um, material development. We've had a number of what, what we in Denmark call 
industrial PhDs that are partly funded by the, the government and partly funded by the industry. And um, I believe we've had about six or seven uh, PhD students um, that have uh, of, of, of this uh, of this sort that have had different uh, topics uh, concentrating on materials. We've had two uh, working with the concrete uh, sector. We've had two with the masonry and and um, and the brick production uh, sector and um, and also we've had uh, one with wood. Presently, we are looking into also from a material perspective, circular economy um, in architectural design process. I believe that's it <laughs> for now. <laughs> wow, uh, that is a very long list. And it feels like that's a lot of areas of focus and a lot of responsibility to put on uh, to one research unit. But it's also not unfamiliar, is it really? I mean, in, in some of these schools and universities and research units, there is always a, a part of that university that is focused on, you know, the industry and working with stakeholders in that industry. And it sounds to me... Uh, from the path that you've taken, Anna, and from the work that I'm aware of previously, that that the path has been quite circuitous with Synarch. So it's it's I find it a very interesting uh, story. And just before we go on, uh, what was that professor's name? Uh, who was the original founder? He was Boye Lundgaard, um, and he also ran when he lived um, a large architectural firm that still still exists. They designed the uh, the National Theatre, which is on the in the very center of the city on the harbor front, and a number of other fine um, buildings in the center of Copenhagen. They also designed, uh, or he designed. He was very much interested in the architectural task of improving what we maybe would call secondary architecture. You could say not the prestigious uh, projects uh, such as theaters or opera houses and, and so forth, but also um, industrial buildings and uh, social housing. So he had a, he had a quite quite a bandwidth and his ex-wife is now running the firm as, as a collective. And a, a question on that. Anna, is that unusual in Denmark? Because the the overview that you just gave, and I don't know that whether it's just me alone who who has this view of Danish architecture or Danish building more generally, but is is that kind of all rounder um, rare in Denmark? Somebody that spanned across the university and practice, but also did some front row public buildings, but then as you also refer to them, secondary buildings. Is is that rare? Well, I. I believe 10 years ago, it wasn't rare. It's becoming more rare as for the fact that we do not have, uh, you could say, prominent practicing architects as professors. We only have one at the moment. When I was educated, uh, most of the professors were both in practice and in the university. We have a lot of associate professors, um, what we call external associate professors that are half-half or like teaching part-time and also running their offices. The way the offices have developed also over the past 10 years is that some of the main Danish offices, um, well-known also in international scale, have been bought by engineering firms. But there's still sort of uh, a separate unit within the engineering firms. What is uh, characterizing most offices is actually the fact that they are working across scales. This is part of our educational foundation or or culture is that the architect is an architect due to the fact that we're working across scales. If we only work one scale, looking at one sort of typology that could be hosp hospitals or schools, whatever, that is more sort of like an in uh, engineering way of thinking. Yeah. Interesting. Well, to follow that point of working across scales, uh, you yourself have an unusual background for a person uh, insofar as I think many would now see you, rightly or wrongly, as an expert in building sustainability and technology, and yet your beginnings, if if I'm right and my reading of your CV is right, uh, were in the humanities and particularly around sort of historical and theoretical questions. 
Uh, how has that informed your work in Sinark? Well, I was uh, educated with, with my late professor, Boy Longo. Since my second year in architectural school, I entered the Department of Architecture and Building Technology. Um, so from that, uh, since I was a young architectural student, I've been working with technical aspects of architecture from a very practical entry. Always thought of myself as becoming or educating myself to become a practicing architect. I didn't think of theory as such per se. Also at at the time, in the late 90s, architectural theory wasn't part of the educational program in that sense that it was sort of balanced with the more practical topics or exercises. So when I finished my uh, my master's degree, I started working as a research assistant for um, my head of the department and my late professor. And uh, we were looking into, uh, at that time, present day construction industry and the, um, you could say, the barriers or dilemmas, the paradoxes, uh, again, from an architectural perspective, why having all this knowledge in, in, in the industry among the various stakeholders, how come that the you could say the tendencies and the development of very specific technical solutions were becoming more and more complex, less beautiful, and less maybe um, logical uh, in that sense that uh, they should not be too difficult. So, so this was where it all started. And then as part of that sort of large research project I was involved in as a research assistant, my head of department tapped my shoulder and said, why don't you, why don't you consider a PhD? At that time, I didn't know what a PhD was all about. So I was like, yeah, why not? <laughs> if you had known, Anna, would you, have, <laughs> would you then have started? I don't think so. It took me some years and, and the, uh, the grand ran out and all that. But anyway, I finished. But um, during, that, during that study, I came, across, um, I, came, I came across the concept of tectonics that had been defined by uh, a number of people in the um, architectural theory theory uh, department and PhD school at University of Pennsylvania. At the time, I read some articles by the late Professor Marco Frascari, who was um, running the PhD school together with Professor David Leatherbarrow. And getting to know their work sort of got, got me on the track of the more theoretical uh, humanities sort of approach to technology, which was a great new perspective um, for me to sort of be, become aware of. Because I was puzzled by the fact that my my Danish professor, he always sort of acted as if he sort of knew what was at stake, but he couldn't maybe formulate it that explicitly. So when I sort of got acquainted with this sort of theoretical work by these people in the US, I, I all of a sudden felt realized that, well, this is what it's all about. This was sort of, sort of like the, the missing piece in the jigsaw puzzle that... Uh, that sort of fitted into this sort of understanding. And also also because the, the concept of tectonics in itself is sort of a, a double-faced uh, concept, both being very practical and very sort of concerning the physical aspects of construction, but also being very philosophical concerning, the, you could say, the, um, the value perspective or the cultural meaning of construction. And so, Anna, I'm curious now, zooming forward to the present day, where a lot of your work focuses on building technologies in the broader sense, uh, and sustainability and, and issues like circular economy, which we'll go on to talk about. Do you find that this background, this theoretical background, but also this broader humanities background gives you a different perspective? Definitely. I do believe that being trained as a PhD and also having to read philosophical texts and having to reflect upon the greater understanding of different positions and and different way, different uh, tendencies that or or power games whatever that that are sort of influencing one another. I do believe that this is very important to be aware of when you work with the the power or the economies in industry, but but also you could also talk about our natural environment as I, I prefer to, to discuss or talk about our natural environment and the, our natural resources, the materials as ecologies in that sense that they are, they are part of ecologies, but they also part of 
ecologies in that sense that they are interconnected, interconnected um, in themselves, but they're also interconnected to other sort of systems. So I believe it enhances a, a systems thinking or a, um, a thinking of coherence. And, and I, I believe that's a different approach than if I was trained with, with a technical background or a, uh, a background in biology, I maybe would have a more singular perspective. Yeah, I, I, I think you're, you're, you're right. And I think as we'll soon start to discuss a bit more, I think the breadth of the background that you have also adds many different facets to the view that you have of, of the present. And you're able to grasp, I think, through that many different uh, theoretical models or philosophical models to do that. But without signposting that too much, that's probably a good point at which to to jump into a closer uh, study or a deeper dive, if you like, into your views and, and the work of Sinarch. And I'd like to start that off with a quote, actually, from yourself that you were recorded as saying, uh, uh, and this was um, a Building 4.0 CRC event that was held in May 2022. Uh, the topic was circular economy. Uh, surprise, surprise, you were there. Uh, talking about this. And I, and I quote now, if we want to go down the path of absolute sustainability, which is needed for our civilization to survive, we have to ask the question in a different way. What can we build now? Because we cannot build high-rise buildings in the way that we did. We may have built all the high-rise buildings that we need. I believe if I'm not mistaken or my my memory is uh, is is correct, that that was the final statement of the the panelists um maybe i could ask you to unpack that a, a little and, and and maybe explain to our audience what you meant by that yeah um i realize it's a very sort of uh strong-headed uh argument but at the same time having or reading articles about how uh, our natural resources um are scarce. Um, the fact that the construction industry is one of the largest consumer of of material resources. Similarly, also a very large provider of uh, waste from the from construction of various kinds. You could say the building uh, the building sector or the um, the market has has developed into a, you could say a similar way of of uh, of a consumer market, as we know from from uh, regular goods. Um, so this whole idea about that we can just keep on um, extracting resources from uh, f from our planet, um, making it into construction is is just this is sort of linear thinking it has become very very critical and and has and is sort of also like an outdated view upon how we as as you could say, cultural um, species uh, are interacting with nature. So from that sort of, you could say, very rough philosophical perspective, we we are looking at the limits of, of our um, consumption in the construction industry. But th that also has to do with the way we have been building, um, uh, you could say the building typologies or the way our urban um fabric has developed uh, for centuries and i in one way i'm i'm a little bit split on this because in one way i'm i'm educated in in a modern architectural tradition and in in modern architectural history we do know that both engineers and architects have for centuries always strived to apply materials and new technologies in order to provide new sorts of structural um opportunities. So it is sort of a very deep ingrained understanding of how to keep progressing um, the use of materials and the structural uh, properties in order to build higher or taller and um, uh, greater spans or uh, larger spaces, whatever. So this sort of this is sort of very a very fundamental understanding or way of thinking within our discipline. But at the same time, that is sort of um, clashing now with the fact that we cannot go on 
this way. I mean, we have to consider, uh, you could say, progress in, in a new way. We have to consider that in case we do not have access to this, to similar materials, similar technologies in the way we used to, or we, at least we thought we did have, what do we do then? We have to sort of make a U-turn in terms of, you could say, finding progress and defining uh, new technologies or new conquers in terms of uh, knowledge. I mean, how do we build in new ways? So it's, it's, it is very, it is, you could say, maybe a philosophical criticism or question as much as it is a very practical sort of direct worry that we cannot keep on going. But when we look at the world right now, it doesn't seem to it doesn't seem to change. So I don't know what should be said or what should be done or what what sort of wars or political actors should be put forward in order to change this uh, development. I, I have no idea at the moment, but at least it has to be it has to be addressed. Uh, look, I agree, and uh, I think what I what I took from that comment and and the rest of your presentation that day, which we've isolated just one line from, is it it was an inherent critique of what we might think of as the current dominant paradigm of incrementalism, meaning okay, our target is to reduce waste by ten percent. Uh, we need to improve the performance of our buildings by. 17%. Uh, we need to recycle 25% of our of our buildings. And and the implicit criticism that I read out of your statement and and particularly the sort of rather provocative element of saying we may have built our last high rise is to say if we can all agree that the next 20 or 30 years are going to be a process of you know increasing incrementally those percentages across those different metrics until we get to a position of full sustainability um, of net zero, real net zero, um, then the question that you and your team are posing is different to that. It's saying, well, can't we just fast forward to 20 years or 30 years from now and say, actually, what can we do? And I think if we if we can't build very large buildings that contain extremely strong materials because they're too carbon intensive, for example, what well, what could we build and what could we build tomorrow, not in five years or 10 years or 20 years? Have I got that right, Anna? Uh, yeah, I think you just said it very beautifully. Uh, I, I haven't been able to formulate it myself this way, but I, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I think that's, that's what it's all about. It is, it is, um, it is definitely uh, a harsh criticism, um, but it also it also grows out of um, research from colleagues at the Danish Technical University. They have had a research group that also have been um, concentrating on circular economy in construction, and they um, they they use the theories of the planetary boundaries. Um, given by the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center. And they looked into, well, if if these are the limits, um, or you could say these are the, the resources at a planetary level we have access to, um, what what is then, what is, I mean, they sort of calculated backwards, you know. So it's like, what, what is then uh, per, per citizen at a global level? I mean, how much, how much space can we take up or can we build in the future or do we have access to? So the, these sort of theories and, and uh, this work have been very inspiring, but also very scary to look into because it's really, really putting the, um, putting the question up front. I mean, what's possible or they're actually telling us not, not very much. <laughs> so, so when we look into this, I mean, they, they're, they are engineer, uh, environmental engineers. Um, when we look into their work and sort of try to translate that into an architectural understanding, also having a holistic approach to the to these questions, such as it's, it's about the natural resources, it's also about the the building technologies and and the processes, and it, but it's also about the client and the stakeholders. I mean, what 
to whom and for what do we build? And finally, we're also very concerned about how do we actually um, communi communicate this through design or by aesthetical means that help people to understand this is a new way of thinking or this is a new structural understanding. So it, so it sort of by itself offers this sort of puzzling, intriguing, but also attractive alternative to, 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 present, to present day construction or architecture. I could see that completely because if you start this working backwards process, uh, we're working backwards from something that we know uh, or that we roughly should know. And it does take out a lot of the uh, subjectivity, one one might say, around what we should do first, second, or third, and and what's more important at the moment, and and all of these uh, trade offs that we're constantly faced with at the moment when we when we when we try to improve buildings or the built environment generally, and and I think that's a really interesting framework to look at. I'd, I'd really like to learn more about that, and I'll I'll certainly press you for a. A link in the show notes at the end of this. Mm -hmm. But one of the downsides of a podcast is that we can't show pictures. Uh, we will certainly include one in the cover. But mm -hmm. for those people that have never come across the work of Synarch, it's worth mentioning here that when Anna asked the question, what can we build now, i.e. tomorrow, uh, that would be sustainable, um, as she was mentioning in our introduction before, uh, a lot of this is material-based studies and, and systems-based studies. And so you are and have become known for a very peculiar mix of vernacular building typologies and materials and systems um, and fusing those, if you like, with industrialized processes and models. Um, uh, I'll make one example that that you took me on a tour of, and that was your your recent interest in thatch uh, as a as a material. Um, again, as a way potentially to build tomorrow, um, and interestingly, not a not a full return to vernacular or traditional building, but but fusing that uh, with these industrialized models. Can you? point uh, me and our listeners towards any projects or examples of your work and that material that 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 you think are significant we, we've just finished this project you're referring to um it has been funded by the Danish environmental um, development and demonstration program um but they also they ask in order to get uh, the funding they also ask the um uh, the participating partners uh, from the industry to to fund half of the half of the project. So, in that sense, you have a great um, a great commitment usually among the partners because they really want to have the full sort of um, benefit from these sort of projects. But in this case, we were approached by the Thatcher's Guild uh, some years ago, and they were very much concerned about the fact that. They believe that they have sort of the, the answer to the green transition in, you could say, in society, but also in the construction industry, due to the fact that their their materials are grown. These are annually um, harvested uh, grasses or straws uh, that grow either either in the in the in the wild natural environment or they can be um, they could be cultivated um, as part of farming. But, but they sort of believe that they could um, they could offer this sort of new path, a new way to um, to look at both the materials and but also the 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 you could say the craft the craftsmanship. So to begin with, we were a little bit skeptical, thinking, well, this is a very very craft, a heavily craft based um, uh, uh, part of the uh, construction industry, and how do we how do we consider that in terms of the, you could say industrialization or the more sort of effective way of um, of building. Uh, also knowing that legislation is one of the great showstoppers in terms of applying biogenic materials in construction today. It has become more and more difficult. Even the, even the wood manufacturers, um, CLT manufacturers and, uh, and so forth are having problems in uh, having their 
their um yeah their products and their the technical solutions applied in construction having them approved by the authorities so from 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 that sort of background um perspective we agreed to um to develop this project together so we had we wanted to have a very close material um uh i say dimension in the project but we also wanted to have this question about what what is the show stop it in case we want to apply more biogenic material in this case thatch or, or straw reed um how could it then be transferred into conventional construction knowing that conventional construction has to be quick and effective and has to be part of the the value chain of the the, the existing value chain um and secondly what are the legis legislative um barriers in terms of making this uh, making this do so these were the sort of background questions uh, or problems uh, we addressed so then we then we started to to develop this project together with the danish fire and uh, in the danish institute of fire and security who who uh, who do who who does all the testing and and um, according to international standards and the improvement of new uh, technical solutions so so in this this little group of architectural researchers um fire engineers and thatchers we we worked across disciplines um in order to to sort of uh engage in these in this in these problems so what came out was was a you could say results uh first we tested new ways of um preventing fire um in this biogenic construction by by use of um simple minerals such as lime or clay and we we found out that clay has very um effective uh fire preventive um properties and um so then we scaled up the um the, the different types we developed um construction typologies and then we had one one final um solution or result that we uh we we transferred into a full scale structure or what we call the house the thatched house corner in order to show the the greater public both within the building sector but also uh yeah the, the general um the, the the general visitor because there was a we had an exhibition at our school that was a public exhibition so we wanted to show this project um in in a way that most people would would have a chance to understand what what could this imply what this way of thinking about this material implementing it into a, a more regular um construction setup uh what would this sort of what would it become so this project was uh, we have disseminated it in um scientific articles and and um uh, journals in the uh, in the danish construction industry um and on various platforms digital platforms but also it has been sent to three different um uh, exhibition uh, or conferences so the project has been exhibited uh, at the moment it's 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 exhibited at the um architecture triennale in lisbon um it also has been exhibited at a um international conference in in the, in olbo denmark uh where people came from all over the world and we sort of had a a section of the structure uh, brought with us to this conference to have it to show it real time but also presenting it in in the scientific article or presentation and finally we've got uh, three actually we have just received another prize last week and this is actually secret it's not public yet but it's it's a it's a very it's a very fine uh international uh a prize or award um so I can't I can't tell you right now, but I will tell you soon <laughs> what it's all about. Yeah. So we and and we, we were very astonished because we just we just um, disseminated as we usually do, but we also brought a lot of different um, drawings and uh, pictures. Uh, we've illustrated all the processes. We have redrawn uh, the structural. Um, uh, 
parts in in different ways um in order to to show by all different means what is this about so we have we have really tried to disseminate the project in a very broad uh, way um and also sending it in to all different kinds of calls and surprisingly to us it has been accepted and nominated and awarded uh, to almost almost actually more or less in in all the different calls we we send it to so it 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 somehow i mean we 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 don't do it differently from time to time uh but within the past year it have great it have gotten so great attention that we kind of sense that there is something um there's something at stake here there's something about the material approach there's something about how can deep grain craftsmanship that grows out of generations of refinement and and sort of and also cultural differences across different uh, countries. Both reed and thatch is actually a worldwide construction uh, typology and craft tradition. So also I believe that many many different um, people or people within the construction construction industry around the world, can see, I mean, are, are are familiar with this sort of um, of building practice. And then finally, the the, the final project we did, uh, actually the one that's now exhibited in in Lisbon, we we try to translate the, you could say, the craftsmanship into a prefab, uh, uh, yeah, prefab cladding system of thatch. So that's so that that sort of has been the, the 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 second step in in the project. And that in itself is also like arbitrary and um, doesn't seem very logical. Well, it seems very logical to me. And firstly, I would say congratulations. It's clearly resonating. And it's it's actually not a surprise to me, I should say, that that it is resonating so much, the the material approach, as you as you call it. I do have a question, though. Thatch is not traditional. Uh, here in Australia where I'm sitting currently, but I did have the pleasure of driving along the coastline uh, of um, Denmark uh, while I was in um, uh, visiting friends in June last year. And I noticed there's an enormous number of thatched buildings, which I I didn't realize. Uh, Do you think in terms of developing new products and and bringing new or in this case old materials uh, back into the market back into public consciousness do you think the fact that there was a pre there was an existing tradition in thatch would make it easier for you potentially down the line to reintroduce this material to the mass market yeah i, I think that's definitely um that's definitely part of it because it's not as as you say it's it's a familiar you could say familiar material a familiar way of of um of of roof covering in 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 many uh, european countries just just as as a as a way to discuss it in terms of like wood or clt um i believe when you have new uh, building materials or new um building components as 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 clt it it may to most people um it it doesn't bring any feelings in in that sense i i think most most people in 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 the broader public do have some sort of opinion or experience with with these sort of roofs either from from traveling as tourists or from their childhood whatever or have family members that had a, an old farmhouse that had a fast roof. So, I I also think that this this whole connection to the materials from a, a more person a more personal and um, sensuous level is is very important. It's not it's not an aspect you see with most new materials entering the market currently. Um, you while I was visiting you in your lab, you showed me a number of different materials that were that we're using, uh, let's call it quasi-traditional materials of straw and, and timber and things like that. Um, but it does seem to be an emerging uh, area, particularly in Northern Europe. I'm not aware in Southern or Central Europe that this is as widespread as it is um, up in Scandinavia and in the other uh, Baltic countries. So I, I thought that was very interesting. And there does seem to be that 
that traditional link there. So I think that's a, a very interesting thing. And, and as you say, the fact that it might actually even be perceived as being something that's of superior quality rather than inferior quality or, or a house made of straw to take the big bad wolf approach to this uh, is is not necessarily bad. Mm. Yeah, very interesting indeed. And and congratulations, I would say, on all of those um, accolades. We will certainly include a, a picture of your wonderful prototype in, in the show notes. And I would definitely ask, um, again, for some links to all of these different places. And, and hopefully uh, we will one day be able to release this new prize that you've won as part of that exercise. Um, but again, I think for me... Um, what really sets that work apart is that we are all familiar with the what you might think of as a historicist turn in architecture. That is, um, you know, the the common um, disgruntlement that people might have with modernity, and that we look across cities and buildings and we say it's all glass and steel, and I don't have a relationship with it. And what we really need to do is to turn back to vernacular building. And I think to draw a distinction here, that's, in, in my view, at least of what I've seen so far of your work and your team's work, is not what's going on here. This is not history for history's sakes. This is history to come back to that question that, that you asked um, back in May 2022 of the audience uh, down here in Australia. What can we build now? And I think that's the really interesting part for me. This is what you can build. And this next phase that you're now undertaking is really about saying, well, how do we take this traditional material and, and all of its qualities and and transform it or, or, or help it be part of the green transition and get into buildings and into the real world and into the mass market? So congratulations on that, Anna. I think it's a, a huge achievement. Um, and I'm sure many listeners will be really keen to see see that material. Um, I know while I have you, uh, listeners may or may not be aware that we've interacted several times over the past, um, I'm going to say, um, uh, six or seven years. And, uh, one of the things that we previously collaborated on was, uh, a book, uh, about prefab housing, um, and some of the, the new research that was coming out of industrialized approaches. And your contribution to that was to talk about something which I was first introduced to to through you and your team, and that is the concept of design for disassembly. Um, obviously, the very sharp, steep uh, emergence of circular economy in all of the public discourse around, you know, broader ecological questions and sustainability has really come into its its own, as it were. Uh, I wonder if you could just unpack some of the work you've done and, and the ideas behind that design for disassembly. Yeah. Um, design for disassembly, I believe we've had a number of PhD students who have looked into that um, both, you could say, directly as from the, from the, uh, from the, from the mere fact that theories that actually have um, uh, come from Australian research environments um, to begin with um, that also build on theories, uh, American theories from the production industry have um, sort of defined this understanding of how different, you could say it's also like part of mechanical engineering that various parts in various products have each their place and of course it will be clever to um, assemble and disassemble this uh, whatever component so so that way of thinking has has of course existed for 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 many years before it becomes a, a regular concept also in in construction um so the two different PhD product pro projects um one that uh was uh finished i believe now 10 years ago um looked into uh, uh partly looked into design for disassembly because it was a larger sort of um could say fundamental research 
in what we could call systems thinking in architectural design. How does architectural design affect system thinking and vice versa? Um, so it was a broader um, project, but part of it was was looking into the work by Kieran, the, the, the American office, Kieran Timberlake, who at the time had developed a, a series of projects that also were um, so, uh, digging deep into into the various processes and and product development as for uh, disassembling construction. And that they did as part of a, uh, you could say, I, I, I can't remember if it was a, a publicly funded project or it was a, a, a private initiative, but it was uh, due to the to the um, uh, the, the natural uh, what's it, um, what's it called the um, the thunderstorms that were uh, harassing large part of uh, Louisiana. Um, so ah, they, yeah, they hurricanes very, or yeah. Tor yeah, tornadoes, tornadoes, probably. Yes. Yeah. So they they wanted to provide a way of building a new housing concept that could be easily produced, built, and maybe removed in case it had to be repositioned um, in, 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 in the local area. So this is where it all started from their interest and, and perspective. And this was developed further uh, into a, a project they, um, they, di they displayed at, at, the, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, but also they built a small scale structure as a summer house uh, for one of the partners in the company. So they, they really went deep into this. They developed architectural um, or, or design uh, um, software that also could uh, handle this. Um, so it was, it was like a full package from uh, the, the product development in itself, but also the, um, the processing and the, um, yeah, the, the whole system uh, as such. So this this way of systems thinking was uh, developed further in a second PhD project that was um, an industrial PhD together with Henning Larsen Architects and our school. And this um, and this uh, PhD student who has now uh, just become an associate professor last week in our center, he um, uh, was very much concerned about you could say the waste handling in construction and uh, how we as architects in the early phases of the design process already sort of decide the the life of the material or the um, you could say the um, the circulation of the material. So this 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 whole sort of design approach to construction um, has been developed in in these various projects, and I. Do believe that now it, of course, it has it has become more. Um, you could, yeah, it it has become a, a greater topic. That's I mean, we not only we are looking into it. It has at least in Denmark, also from an engineering perspective, it has become a very interesting um, topic. Um, and mm -hmm. but it's it's mainly driven by the industry. Uh, from what I see, is that. We do have a number of different uh, contractors that are now very interested in how, if they have to do refurbishing or renovation projects, um, and they they bid on the um, on or you could say on on the contract on the uh, how to take down the, the 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 structure or the construction and and handle the materials in Denmark. We have very high taxes on handling waste um so of course from a contractor perspective they're interested in you could say the the circular flow of of the materials in that sense that they don't have to pay these um these taxes so in case they can develop develop um processes and and um you could say businesses around handling the different components uh taken out of of uh, existing construction, and they also can, together with architects, uh, define ways of repurposing these materials or components. Then, then you also have the you could say the design for disassembly approach, 
in the waste handling because they have to they have to um show or at least anticipate ways of its its um its future use so we we you could say the design for this is simply a problem or topic has has grown uh not only being um a question of of uh making a beautiful design details or uh yeah just from the you could say the the high end aesthetic uh approach but it's also very very low key practical uh considerations about i mean if we take out these old windows maybe we can reuse them for another building um how do we do that uh where is it um where is it uh yeah what is it so it's middle life in terms of when we take it out and it has to be repurposed um can we digitize it in a way or at least uh, categorize it so new project projects and new clients can actually make the bits on these sort of materials i mean this this whole thing has really exploded over the past couple of years and we have a number of large groups uh, across industry and universities and and authorities that are looking into how can we how can we make this setup sort of like a business setup so it has really become a big thing i think at least within the the past five years it has really exploded yeah and uh, that's a really interesting point you make that i hadn't thought about until just now as you were explaining that to us uh, i think when kieran timberlake developed that and 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 if you look at the loblolly house i don't think that was originally as you're suggesting as well developed along ecological or sustainability lines per se it was more around speed of assembly you know, standardization of parts and interfaces and all of those kinds of questions. And and as you're suggesting, this has sort of come full circle, pardon the very terrible pun, back to the circular economy to deal with, as you're saying, waste, um, new businesses to set up around that and establishing a full economy around the way buildings are designed, um, used, demolished, and then reused effectively. Uh, but Anna... I might, if I might, while I've got you here, ask you another uh, question that uh, is a bit of a selfish question for me, because I have it from one of our mutual colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Duncan Maxwell, uh, that you've been reported, and I've never been able to verify this with you because I've never remembered, but here we are uh, on a podcast together, that you, uh, at least via Duncan, are reported to have said um that construction is not one industry but many uh is this quote attributable to yourself and if so what did you mean by that yeah I, to be honest i can't remember if i said that but i i definitely i definitely <laughs> uh, know that's how it is yeah it's many industries um and it holds it holds many ecologies as, as i said earlier it it's it's because we often speak about the industry and that's i think that's a general problem also also in a broader public discussion about how to develop uh, societies and policies and economies is that is that many people i believe think of the construction industry as some as a very professional industry it's not something people engage with regular people don't really care about what sort of um, insulation material they have have bought or it's in in their walls or what sort of um uh, you value the the glass coating of their of their glass panes in their windows have and all that so in that sense um i think most people think of the construction industry as one industry or something that is sort of over there right but but it's so much more than that, it it's it it in it it somehow defines people lives. Um, in similar ways, I, I I often use the um the um the reference uh, as uh or yeah as for medicine in that sense that when doctors are caring and responsible for the uh, the human health, you could say people in the construction uh, construction industry and I often refer to the architects, um, uh, naturally. Are, are taking care of of the um 
the building physics and you could say the um, the body of of our building environment our urban environment so just even considering that it it brings so much so much um more into the equation yeah so so that's like that that's sort of the um the the greater take on that but also as for the you could say the different sorts of economies something we have discussed in the in the thatch project uh, actually we approached a number of politicians uh, wanting them to consider um how the different um you could say the different legislation, but also the different economies across sectors, such as the agricultural uh, sector, um, how to say, included or considered in in terms of the construction sector, could be um, could be uh, yeah could could be reconsidered, and at at policy level, um, the, the people we met they kept saying, well, these are two different sectors. We don't discuss agriculture together with construction. And um, and we were sort of very um, devastated by by that sort of uh, very silo based thinking that that we have to categorize these uh, questions in in different um, in in different corner, corners corners um, of of the boxing ring and and it's and because we find them interconnected if we have to if we have to find new ways of producing materials. Um, and we have to look into all different kinds of of, of materials. Uh, then we have to we have to also consider uh, thinking across um, sectors and and policy levels and and very very low key pra uh, practical concerns also from a user perspective. So so all these things are interconnected, um, and of course people often get tired when you get started talking about it this way because they want um they want mere facts and they want uh very sort of uh short and um and uh easy conceivable um definitions in order to take quick decisions but i don't think at the time what we're looking into at at, at a global level there's no quick fix there's no fast track or whatever it's called it's we really have to um, consider every possibility, and we have to we have to consider them from some uh, from or, yeah a renewed position or at least try. Um, so so, so that you could say the complexity, the intertanglement of different uh, interests and economies. Um, that is that is for sure um that is for sure the uh you, i wouldn't call it the problem but at least the um the challenge i know i think that's a fantastic place for us to end today uh i love the line that we should consider every possibility and and the thing that i personally took away uh from our lovely meeting back in june of 2022 in copenhagen was how seriously you and everyone else in your team that I met as taking this challenge. Uh, and I think really original work, um, clearly work that's resonating out with the wider industry and uh, professions. And I congratulate you on it again. And I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, and thank you um, for being so generous uh, with your, your time uh, and your work. Uh, as always, the notes and references that Anna has referred to here today will be included in the online uh, for now. Uh, thank you again, Anna, and thank sure. you to our audience. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you for very clever and uh, challenging questions.